All right, good morning, everybody. It is, it is 9 a.m. I'd like to call this meeting of the Community and Economic Development Committee uh, to order. It is Thursday, January 4th at 9 a.m. here at the training room at uh, 4700 Elmore Road. And I am Assemblymember Martinez, and we'll go with uh, introductions from Assembly members. Kevin Cross. Karen Bronga. Scott Myers. Zach Johnson. Uh, and we're joined by staff, and as folks who have the opportunity to talk with us today, please rem remember to introduce yourself. And on the phone, we have Member Assault. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, Member Constant called and said that he has a conflicting appointment and probably will not be able to join us today. So we have a couple of items on our agenda. And uh, the first item, I wanted to just make sure we continue to have that conversation that we started last time about the peak season prep. We talked about staffing and, uh, and heard some challenges. We, I just wanted to have a little, make sure we followed up on that as we moved into a little bit of the discussion of what our annual goals should be. And, um, and just to get a, a little more refinement on that conversation, spend a little bit of time, uh, time on that. We, we will make some updates to the annual work plan review, which is always on the back of the agenda. And you'll see there are actions that we have taken. There are some updates to be in the work. So after these conversations, today is especially um, through the next rules committee for the assembly, we'll talk about goals. And I wanted to make sure that we cleared off goals that we had identified here that we have handled. We understand why some goals that we could have handled need to continue and maybe refine some of the, the priorities and the goals in alignment to where the municipality is headed as well. So the first question I had on this front was uh, with respect to the conversation about staffing. Uh, there is a upcoming municipal job fair. As a starting point, just to recognize, is that are those the types of actions that people are taking with respect to staffing, to recruitment? Um, is there an opportunity to utilize that? And are there any other specific actions that uh, that are being taken that we can learn from to help support the recruitment and the retention of staffing in the permitting department? So if anybody, I don't know if anybody has any answers to that, but. Uh, I'll turn it over uh, to Chip. Um, this is Lance Wilber, Community Development Director. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, the job fair is a week from this Friday. It's at the Denina. It's from 10 to 4.30. I have multiple departments who will be there represented. Um, we've got some folks that are going to be there in shifts. It's going to uh, share the types of work that we do, the opportunities that we have. We also recognize that there will be folks from the um, Human Resources Department there. So. If there are opportunities, I mean, I suspect that HR will have themselves set up for application process right there. We'll, uh, we'll have a variety of folks from either development services planning, um, also from streets and the labor side of the house. So we'll have a, you know, a good showing there from the departments that uh, represent community development. And it's really sort of to learn what opportunities we have and the process in which they would, an applicant would have to go through um, to get hired out of the municipality. And I think for most of the folks that I know that are going, um, they'll also be aware of opportunities for advancement inside the municipality. Uh, and so I think that's, that's as much as I know right now, and that's our level of participation at this point. Uh, great. Uh, is there any way that we can support the outreach uh, through our committee, through publishing, uh, kind of information that you just shared as well, or the flyer, uh, particularly to grow the audience participation? Um, I would. I, I don't know the direct answer to your question. Uh, and, uh, the program has been sort of launched and uh, marketed through the mayor's office. So Junior Alameo is the one that I'm getting the information from and coordinating, and he's the one that's encouraged us to attend. So I reach out to them to find out what assistance they may need or how they might be able to support. All right. And, and just the specificity, the assembly has promoted this on our um, communications as well, and I know different members have promoted this job fair as well. But if there's any specificity to trying to get information in front of specific audiences, like if we're recruiting specifically for the permitting department or for jobs that may have not necessarily the, the street-facing obviousness, 
that a walk-in person may have, if there's designated kind of targets that we can help to push this job thing out there for like different people in different sectors that we may be targeting to know about, that would be helpful information to okay. share with us. Okay. Any other? Yeah, Mr. Cross. Yeah, it would be great if, uh, and maybe you've, uh, I don't know when it's been updated, it's been a while, but what that looks like as far as our current load, what we're, what our vacancies are, and then kind of, because so I can do what that is as a percentage. Because I recognize that, you know, if you, let's, you know, if I just use round numbers, let's say I had a department that needed 10 people and I'm at six and I needed four, you might say there's 40% less, but I mean, you're 40% short. But we understand that if even if you hire two or three people, that that's going to then require training, which then will temporarily, at least for some duration of time, reduce the productivity of those six, right? Because uh, they just don't, they don't learn in a vacuum. And so, you know, and, and the larger your amount of vacancies get, the more burden it puts on already a burdened department. Because I don't want anybody to be under the assumption that just because we filled some positions, we should be solving these problems overnight. In fact, there's probably gonna be some immediate pain associated with individuals still trying to maintain their current level of productivity while hiring new individuals. And so as long as we have a correct, you know, perception of what that looks like, and that in order to solve something, it may have to be temporarily painful, I think it's an important thing to, to quantify. I think, uh, similar to the cross, I think you were right on. I think we're not the only ones experiencing that. In some cases, you know, um, the opposite happens. We get some amazing quality uh, candidates, and it just it makes everything go a lot quicker. It's not automatically everybody else has to slow down. So it just depends. Um, it depends on the level that we're hiring and the type of position that we're hiring. And um, so it's not always the case that everybody has to slow down, but it is often the case as you described. So. Um, yeah, well, even if they're competent in their field, they may not be uh, well adversed in uh, our, our process or our software, right? And so, from what I understand, we have significant software issues. So, but don't disagree. All right, thank you. Uh, Member Salt is on the line in queue. Member Salt? Great. Thanks, Member Martinez. So, based on this conversation last meeting, <laughs> We set up a work session to put information is on January 19th at 1 p.m. around the hiring process. So I know last time we talked about the dynamic portal not working, um, control of, you know, forced requirements that would automatically kick out uh, candidates. We talked about um, sending over resumes that were, again, being screened, uh, possible retention ideas. But I just wanted to encourage anyone that has any feedback uh, for that meeting, please send it to uh, the assembly so we can make sure that those issues are brought up during that work session uh, on the 19th at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Member uh, Salt. Great. Um, any other members within? Uh, while we're sticking on this agenda item, um, and I appreciate you being here, uh, Lance. It seemed to me that when we inherited the legislative list from last year, I was trying to find the threads to operational relationships. So like, what is the, what's the thread and the relationship between the committee's legislative priorities and the municipality's workflow? Um, some of those things seemed connected in that there's a legislative priority of expediting the permitting process and there is that intention as well inside, right? But, but there are the challenges with staffing and all the other stuff that comes along. But that seemed to me a very small area of alignment and I was interested in at least introducing that as we move forward into reviewing and updating our annual legislative uh, our priority list, that we work to, to some extent with improving the relationship directly to you, Mr. Wilbur, because your department is fundamentally the same name as this committee, yes. community and economic development. Right. And from my vantage point, the administration has seen your shop as expansive. There's a lot of opportunity to explore with this committee. 
So I would love for us to think about ways that we could be aligned with the workflow coming out of the out of your shop, so that we can align and be supportive, and then also that we can be part of the, the think tanking and the public interface to some of the, the initiatives that you all are seeking to accomplish. Um, through the chair, Mr. Martinez, I appreciate that. As a matter of fact, I'm doing the same, I'm planning on doing the same with my department heads. I'm asking them what are the things that they want to accomplish in the next quarter, the next six months, and the next year. What do they have that they're finishing? What are the things that they want to get initiated from the department's perspective to find out what that is about? And then where we have some synergy or commonality between our, our priorities and your priorities. But I'm also going to ask them not only just create me a list, Create me the list in which we can. There's a list in which they want to do, and there's a list we can do. And I want to know both. Um, so uh, that, that's a conversation I'm going to be having with them in the next couple of weeks. So I think we're both on similar paths. No, that's that's very exciting because I also want to make sure that our committee reaches its full potential in the scope of what we can accomplish, and um, and make sure that we're aligned so that we can actually have outcomes and action. Yeah, I, I, I also want to make sure that I'm managing expectations of my staff and my directors and this committee. So we all can wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. And so I'm looking forward to that continuation. And that extended uh, invitation to you to make sure that we do have a regular update, regular report. And as you're thinking of your departments, what are those things that could be reported to us regularly? And we talked a little bit about last year about this dashboard sort of concept. I don't know the usefulness of, of, of of all the data that could be available. But thinking, for me, it's always about how do we communicate to the public the work that's happening, similar to Mr. Cross's point, that recognizing that sometimes the expectations of the public are different than the, the arc of the work uh, that we can accomplish. So making sure that we do have that for the public to see. And a lot of the public, just to make sure that they know that there is a clearinghouse municipal and the assembly, I mean, the administration and the assembly for these conversations of community and economic. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Will. Will any members have any comments on that as well? Great. Now we'll move into the, uh, the new business items. And the first item, uh, is a quick is a quick one for me. I just wanted to make sure that we brought it back. Um, it's been talked about uh, at the at other meetings, um, and even a pilot program was thought about with respect to pallet shelters. I'm not interested in the in the policy side of the application. Respectfully, where pallet shelters live in the continuum of housing or in the continuum of homeless response. I think those are different questions. I, I'd like us to make sure that we continue to focus on the structural details that will allow or disallow the creation of these alternative types of housing modules and units. And so from my vantage point, when we, uh, when Mr. Cross and myself and Mr. Johnson worked on a uh, an ordinance around the uh, sanctioned camps in the summer, we intended to create a framework for the application, the allowability of alternative structures. I'd like us to continue to focus on that particular piece preemptively so that if there is a pilot project, I think we funded a, a, the potential of a pilot project, and if there are others who want to move into that space, that we do have a code that aligns to that potential. Um, and so I didn't have necessarily an action on it, but I wanted to introduce that. That was something, Mr. Cross. Yeah, and I, I think it's very important that we're expanding beyond just this idea that we had when we were talking about sanctioned camps. Okay, that's a very limited application. I think realistically, unless you're, you're living with your head in the sand, you see that there's a huge movement across the United States for people to find other affordable housing options, which don't necessarily meet the traditional sticks and bricks model that we've come to know and, and built all our code and everything around. Uh, you know, timber homes, there's a bunch of different ones where you can see where they're taking pallets and converting them into beautiful little residential houses. And then they'll be able to ship them all over the United States. And we're shipping them to 49 other states. Uh, and in fact, Wasilla, but not Anchorage. Okay? They're, we don't use them here. 
and you can say the economics are whatever it is, but really it's because we're, our, our land use code and our building code is not conducive to non-traditional forms of construction. So it'd be interesting to look at, are there reasonable ways that you can adjust that, that make less expensive, still safe, clean and nice housing options for, uh, for use of housing, right? Understanding that when you can utilize a labor force primarily in another state or somewhere else where they have it and then ship the house up, you know, there's, there, there may be considerable cost savings. And then what do we need to do as far as uh, the foundation type or what kind of uh, seismic structure do we have so it's not basically just a habitable shed? Or what are those interpretations in code that are saying that, hey, listen, only at this point does it meet a residence? So how do we keep up with what's happening across the rest of the world? In, in lieu of trying to solve the housing problem that extends beyond acreage. Because I'm just wondering why, well, that's good there, but why not here? And that's not, I guess that's not a good enough answer. Well, we just don't do that. Like why, what is it specifically, what is the problem we're trying to address, and how do we get to yes? So I'd love to hear thoughts on that because I'm sure everybody's, I'm sure we're all aware of what kind of structures we're talking about. Have a problem? So I, that just made me think of, um, I've been going to the town halls at the shelters, and I had a couple gentlemen tell me that they could afford 400 a month for housing. And, you know, so we really do, I mean, they don't want free housing, these particular men who were talking to me, that, that they want something, they, they were telling me that um, the, what, is it, what do you call it, the youth hostel type model. They said they're fine walking down the hall, using a restroom down the hall, sharing a kitchen. They don't mind that, but um, those options aren't available to them. But I was going to ask uh, Mr. Gates if um, I had heard that Mr. Rivera was working on um, making pallets allowable for a pilot project, but I also wondered if what you're working on would extend to churches that are trying to do parking lot models of a couple of um, tiny homes. Um, well, the short answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> and we still get draft forms and we fix it in terms of scoping and uh, what we would have to do with this. And you know, I had some sort of sick last week that was my window to really get this draft in there, and, but um, it's not quite right. So, uh, what I was working on is really more of uh, what to nest centers, um, or needs, where we have a pilot project for a uh, pilot like children uh, use, uh, and that ordinance has been 27 years for we passed just have a temporary or two single one time in the time and wait for the time for the use, but also in the type 23 uh, to describe the types of shelters, whether they were the um, hard walled pallet shelter type like structures or tents, but they're uh, congregated. And uh, that passed, so we've got at yeah, least the uh, exception from the building permit to the requirements on that in place. But uh, I'm not sure if the church sets up a number of shelters or um, some other operators, one of these pilots that sets up a number of shelters in the day to day, how exactly that would be interpreted in type of what currently without the sort of needs that we need to do this. So um, we have the Centennial Park uh, scenario that I think that we um, just going to move some people here in the room and it's better than uh, I'm trying to recall exactly how that was interpreted by me to have a 21 code enforcement or if they were called out to do so. And, um, but basically, what we want to avoid, what the ordinance I'm trying to draft, which is uh, so if somebody calls to complain, it seems popping up, you know, in my neighborhood, this is loud, and code enforcement goes, and he says, to run it's like, uh, then they would be you know, prohibited and get shut down. Mm -hmm. don't want to see so anyway, uh, for a church, I think what you're talking about is having that sort of children, children set up as an ancillary use. So um, the draft uh, can uh, include as an ancillary use, that sort of thing, ancillary use or not ancillary use. And um, 
That's the direction that we thought was going. Okay. Can I ask one more question? So, so is the land use the issue now, or there's also like uh, shipping containers? It's not okay. That pallet that uh, has a certain building code, the, the commercial pallet, is okay. Are we having running into problems that um, a tiny little home model would have to be uh, vetted by the planning department? And there's certain ones that are vetted. Uh, I'm just not sure how that. Well, so when um, Member Cross mentioned that the shipping containers weren't being used, I, I've seen the same thing, some pretty amazing models of that. Um, are they prohibited at this time? Can anyone tell me? Yeah? yeah they, they would feel fine for me. Number 21 doesn't specifically uh, dictate uh, the type of material okay. that you use uh, in building a, a structure or a home. Uh, so shipping container or pallets, things of that sort, or just looked at like any material to build a home. I think the challenges uh, with those structures, or those materials, I should say, uh, are more on the Title 23 side. And I don't mean to point over to uh, uh, the Ross, but I, I would venture to guess that it is a structural thing. It's a wind load, it's a snow load uh, issue more so than it is the actual material itself. Okay. Can I, so if, if there's a church that uh, St. John's United Methodist that the, the ministers drew up plans for tiny little homes that he's hoping that many churches will follow the model. So he would take his plan to you guys and you would inspect it to make sure that it had snow load, wind, you know, all that. So, Title 21 focuses on the land use uh, that, mm -hmm. is, uh, that is there. So, what they're trying to do, what it's actually designated as. Is it a home or shelter? Is it a, a transitional living facility? Transitional so, that's, so, that's what Title 21 focuses on. Uh, Ross and, her, and his group with, uh, with Title 23 will focus on those more structural life safety issues. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, and just to follow up to Mr. Uh, Mr. Gates, is the is the the piece of legislation that you're working on and drafting focused on these types of shelters as it relates to a type of housing response or homeless response, or is it more generic? Um, it's focused more on them as a type of homes response okay. to transition. What we did last summer was remember it was called Loud Camp in the Indians Bridge. Yeah. So we up, it's not a tank or hunt, it's a charge of these so we did transition to clippers and all this. And this is just to put them up. So I would only encourage that to similar to Mr. Cross's kind of point earlier, and I, I know he's next in the queue, is that I'm interested in the way the city explores housing and alternative structures independent of the, the, the problem uh, or the, the policy application, right? So that they may be applied to solutions in a homeless response. But they, I'm thinking of generally, how do we make alternative shelters like these shelters available? Not necessarily just in response to homelessness. So I, I just leave. Well, it almost sounds like you're talking about um, multi-family housing, existing with small structures, a number of small structures, multiple structures on a lot of multi-family housing. I mean, people pay rent and stuff like that. Um, just, just to follow up, type of structure. Like not necessarily that. Thinking of the why. So we've heard pallet shelters in response to pilot programs to support the homeless continuum. That's a why. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in that the city needs alternative structures for housing that could be applied in that direction. My why is more general and generic. Um, yeah, um, the why in terms of part of the homeless solution is more what I'm looking at. But, uh, Bladder in school, but not exactly help. I would just not apply it directly in that way. Um, 
you want to jump in with Ross? And she had her hand up. And Ross, you have a response to this? I, I think I have uh, okay. information that might clarify your question. Cool. <clears throat> uh, so uh, the advantage to a pallet shelter, this is Ross Nossing, our condoning official, is they can be de deployed so quickly, right? So they're, they're, they're just little kids, you take them out and you set them up. The disadvantage to them is they're not durable. They're, they're not uh, a type of housing that's going to last very long because um, it's an aluminum frame and the walls are foam plastic insulation, or foam plastic insulation. They're only about an inch and a half, two inches thick maybe, with like an FRP or plastic casing on each side. Um, so that's the disadvantage. So the application to them would be short-term quick setup, maybe, type of response. Um, but you wouldn't you wouldn't apply that application to long-term housing. Thank you, Ross. Uh, Rob? Yeah, um, I guess another, <clears throat> excuse me, another kind of dimension to add to the discussion about pallet shelters is who. Um, so I understand wanting to look at the code and then look at how we can make this fit into our regulatory structure, but also um, it really does matter kind of who, what the plan is for using them, right? Like how close they are together, you know, and I, appreciate the comment about the building structure. I think that's something we could figure out. Um, but it is tricky because we're kind of talking about it. Well, so there is something proposed, um, a specific project proposed for these. So there's that. Um, beyond that, though, this is not something the city is going to really deploy, probably. Um, or I guess it's possible we do, but then we're basically signing up to run a small you know, shelter housing uh, campus, whatever it ends up looking like. And I think what we've been talking about is more that happening on private land and then we're facilitating that happening. So I think that's the tricky thing for me is um, is beyond looking at the building code. It's it's hard to say, okay, here's here's all the scenarios that we could possibly use these. It's more like we need somebody to bring forward a project, which I know has already happened and we're gonna be discussing. Um, Cause it really does need to also look at, you know, how is that gonna operate? Cause I think there's the structures and then there's, is this going to be successful for, for, for people living there? Just like we can't just build a shelter and then not talk about who's operating it, what the model is, what the funding, you know, all those other pieces. And so, um, so I think it is useful to say for this particular structure type, how do we make that allowable in code? And then beyond that, in terms of like how this operates actually, beyond, you know, we, that's a separate question. I think we really can't figure that out as just the city on that. No, I just say I think the only way we're going to come up with any answers is we need some specific case studies. Yeah. Perhaps if we wanted to do one on an R1 lot, if we wanted something that was less restrictive, like a, like a rural lot on R4 or something, or something where you wanted to put maybe four or five of them on, right? What are the barriers to having this done? Because if somebody wanted to put five one-bedroom pallet shelters on a, on a lot, okay, you get your well and septic requirements, but then over five, we're going to treat that like commercial. Are we going to blow the, and then at which point, no. Okay. So where are we? preventing affordable housing unintentionally. And the only way we're gonna solve those answers is some case studies. So perhaps we need to put those together. One is find somebody who has a model that they're willing to share what that looks like, and then take an actual lot and just work through the process. Because I tell you it's more than just the, the Title 21. It is some land use, because if you were to put four or five, then you go into traffic and they're like, okay, well, then are we gonna to have to put a big cul-de-sac in here? Can I just put driveways? How much of that lot? So, I mean, we have accessibility issues that then trigger some pretty hefty expense. Um, and so, which which I personally see blow projects out of the water where you want to put, where you have a five acre lot that you want to put four buildings on, but you discover they're not going to look at them like driveways, they're going to look at it like a, like a, a city street. And now I got I got $250,000 worth of infrastructure or, or road improvements or whatever you got to do before I can even put my buildings up. No, never mind. I'm not, put, we're not putting five buildings on this lot. We'll put one small, because it'll pencil. So again, until you take specific case studies and we have one, you're probably not gonna, I mean, it's all just conjecture. Great, um, and, and, he, and I appreciate the, uh, the comments, Ross. What I, one of the things I heard was the, the distinction between the, the the durability or the permanency, the temporary nature of these types of structures. And just to clarify, do, do we currently have, or what is the current framework of temporary allowable structures uh, in Anchorage with respect to this conversation or are, are these updates that we're making going to be helpful? Uh, and then I'm sorry, I missed you. No, that's the answer. 
uh, through the chair, um, we did work on the, the Title 23 roadblocks, the pallet shelters, and the Title 21 last summer. And I forget all the details, but the information went back uh, through Dean and everything, and, I, and I'm just not sure where the assembly is with that information. <clears throat> Thank you, Ross. And we'll look forward to uh, that. Um, do we have a timeline on that, Mr. Gates? It seems possible. Hey. <laughs> we like to start the new year with optimism as soon as possible. Great. Uh, awesome. And so this conversation, I expect that we will be able to see uh, any legislative items and hopefully use this committee as well to uh, to discuss uh, the, the thing that you're working on with Mr. Rivera. And uh, we'll look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to uh, the next item of business is, uh, and this is where thinking a little beyond the legislative box of last year, I wanted to make sure that we were really tracking this, right? So as I looked last year, and you went through all of the legislative priorities for this committee, uh, very important things, but there's not a lot of cool on that. There's nothing really cool, what makes the city cool. Um, what, what is economic development that drives attention to the city? And on that front, uh, I wanted to make sure that we started having a conversation around the creative economies of the city. It's a, it's a project that I've worked on previously in, uh, during my time in a previous administration. And uh, it's a project that uh, has multi multiple facets to it. And the first facet that we'll have an opportunity to hear about today is the music ecosystem of our city, of our state, and the way it connects to what's called the Cascadia Music Ecosystem, which is really a regional approach. We'll have, we have documents on the website for this. A member of Constant and myself traveled to Boise a couple of weeks back to attend a music policy forum that had representatives from uh, the Northwest and other parts of the country talking about uh, the, the, the larger economic dynamics of, a, of the music ecosystem. And today we have on the phone with us, Marion Call, who is uh, part of the Alaska Independent Music Initiative, ACM. They're hosting a upcoming music summit in Anchorage. Um, and I'd love to introduce Marion Calls on the phone, who will give us uh, a little bit of the what they're working on and an invitation to the summit. Marion? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Check, check. All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. That was a great introduction. I'm glad I get to be cool. I'm not usually invited to do that. Um, Co-Chair Martinez invited me here today to talk about Akini and uh, a new partnership that was just announced in the music sector between Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, uh, and potentially sometimes BC. Uh, this is called the Cascadia Music Corridor, and it's a regional collaboration and a branding effort to share resources and facilitate music travel and music tourism within and between all of our states. Um, when uh, when I think of why this is important, uh, the first thing that occurs to me is that when people talk about the Pacific Northwest as a tourism region, they very seldom mean us. We're often excluded from this. And so we're very excited to be at the table and be an equal partner with these other states as we work on developing our music uh, ecosystem. Um, the goal for all of our states is to strengthen and grow our music sectors uh, on every level and to support and retain businesses and key talent. Um, my organization is currently working with Music Oregon, Music Idaho, King County Creative, and the Music Policy Forum. Those are sort of our, uh, our compatriots in these other states to develop the Cascadia Music Corridor Initiative. Um, I'll tell you some of the concretes in it. Uh, about it in a moment, but first, uh, is it okay if I give you a little bit of music sector 101? Uh, because that's something that actually a lot of um, policymakers don't get a chance to engage in. Um, I work with 
ACIMI, the Alaska Independent Musicians Initiative. We're a statewide nonprofit, and we are the Alaska State Council for the Arts sort of outreach group to the music sector. We work on behalf of Alaska's entire music sector. We've also been doing specific anchorage work um, through funding from the municipality on certain projects. Um, the music sector includes our symphonies and our operas, kind of the big players, but the music sector is also all of our bar bands, our private home teachers, hundreds and hundreds of private home teachers, uh, DJs, audio engineers, violin makers, kids recording TikToks with beats in their homes, mariachi bands, our, our worship leaders, cantors at the synagogue, folk festivals, venues, bookers, promoters. It's a very big system. And when you think of it all together, all that activity together, that's a ton of economic activity and cultural activity. The economic activity is often invisible because it vanishes into bars and restaurants. It looks like bars and restaurants, right? When you go to First Tap, that's measured in beer sales. But the musicians sold the beers, right? Um, and so we have to do specialized work and research to understand the size of our economic activity. But that's becoming popular to do because we've seen other cities that invest in their cool, that invest in their creative economy, reap tremendous rewards. Um, so in our field, we find it more accurate than just calling it a creative economy to call it a creative ecosystem. This is our music ecosystem um, because it's a dynamic and intertwined, very organic system. It doesn't measure easily. It doesn't behave like other economies. And a lot of activity takes place for free in addition to activity that takes place for a simple exchange of money. Um, and like any ecosystem, we make it healthy with good policy and good programs, um, or we allow it to wilt when we bring a lack of intentionality to it. Akimi's mission is to foster intentionality around our music sector and see it strengthen and grow. Um, when it's healthy, the music ecosystem contributes significantly to the economy. Um, music makers are workers. We are industry. And so that's why you're hearing from Akimi today and why I hope that you'll hear from us in the future. Um, and music is not just economy. It's also public health. Music is a human imperative. Music is suicide prevention. Music is youth and talent retention. Music is elder care. Music is community building. Music is culture in action. Um, there's a reason that cities that invest in their music sector see rises in quality of life reports and see, uh, see development. The artists come to a city, even a city that has been in decline for a long time, they invest in it, they make it cool, and you see businesses return, you see families choosing to stay. So it's a, it's a, a sector like any other, but it has a little bit of magic power. Um, artists make things cool. Um, so that's the nature of the work that Akimi does in developing Alaska's music ecosystem, and that's why we do it. Um, when we look at Anchorage in particular, and the Anchorage music scene, you know, think of all the venues, think of your favorite local bands or, or institutions. Um, when we think of Anchorage, we compare it to places like Reykjavik and Portland. Um, even Boise is actually a pretty good comparison as a city that's uh, large but fairly remote within the United States. Um, and these are places that have used music sector development as a tool to help them flourish. Um, <clears throat> so the Cascadia Music Corridor Project with Washington, Oregon, and Idaho uh, is very exciting for us because we're so closely connected to the rest of the Northwest, as all of us who have a mental map of SeaTac Airport know. Um, and all of our states have a key interest in travel, regional travel, between and around our states, both for our music makers, for our you know bands that want to go on tour, for people who need an educational opportunity, for my friend who just needed to go buy a brand new double bass and had to go to Portland to get it. Um, that travel is key for our industry. And the opportunity for increased tourism travel around those states, um, for making it easy, intentional, and cool, um, is something that we're tapping into. It's very normal for folks in Alaska to fly to Vegas for a weekend for a concert, right? And we want to make the reverse true as well. Um, we have amazing festivals, we have amazing music, um, and developing it can help put Anchorage on the map. Um, I think immediately of Parlor in the Round, which has been trying for a very long time to get some sort of national syndication, national coverage, podcasts, 
um, and which deserves it, frankly. Um, but we don't have a lot of infrastructural supports for that kind of thing to happen. And that's what we'd like to see built through the Cascadia Music Corridor Project. The concrete, uh, the concrete implementation of this, um, as we're getting into it, looks like creating templates for artist exchanges and trade routes. Like, okay, so we already have some Anchorage artists that are playing many years at the Tree Fort Music Festival in Boise. Great, let's make that a reciprocal relationship and like a silk road between here and there for our artists to get educated, to you host me, I host you, um, to do education projects while they're there. And when we get artists up here, um, getting them around the region, getting them into education spaces so that they're not just playing, they're also contributing to our larger music ecosystem um, or visiting our smaller communities, getting invested in Alaska, in our neighborhoods, in our venues, um, in our programs. Uh, that's what intentionality brings to, uh, to this regional proposal. Um, I'm working with, uh, right now, uh, two different festivals to try and template what these artist exchanges look like. Uh, going to be working with the Folk Life Festival in Seattle and with Tree Fort in Boise about, okay, what, what do we build? What's the concrete vessel that we build, whether it's money buckets or um, sets of spreadsheets uh, that make these exchanges possible and that make them templatable so we can, for example, have multiple exchanges for Anchorage to get our artists in and out, to get our educators and uh, folks who need education in and out and to give them a reason to return. Um, another thing that this looks like is uh, getting Alaskan music in public and private spaces. When tourists come to Alaska, they're immediately immersed in our nature and in our visual culture in a wonderful way. Um, we want to add music culture to that. When Alaskans get off uh, the cruise ship, when they get off the plane, we want them to immediately be hearing Alaskan music on the buses, in the airport, in the hotels. We want that to be a point of pride. We've seen this work very well for, for example, Austin, Iceland, Seattle, and we can do that too. Um, it's a matter of public-private relationships, nonprofit work, and again, intentionality. And Akimi's busy building the tools to try and make that happen, such as multi-hour playlists that we can deliver to retailers um, and say, hey, you want to do Alaska music Friday, or that we can deliver to tour bus companies and say, hey, I know you're playing, you know, hits from the 70s, but what if you actually played the music from this place that's fantastic, that people love, and that will elevate the profile of our artists and make it cool to be here. Um, these are all concrete initiatives we're working on right now. I'm going to wrap up here so that I can uh, get out of the way for the rest of the meeting, but um, we invite you, of course, to uh, hear more about what we're working on and what the Cascadia Music Corridor Initiative looks like at the Alaska Music Summit, which will be this Saturday, at, uh, sorry, not this Saturday, next Saturday, January 13th at the NAVE. Um, it will also be streaming on Zoom. It's free to attend. Uh, registration is required, but uh, every year it's been fantastic and it's been about developing creative solutions to make Alaska and Anchorage's music scenes um, what they could be, considering the amazing talent and the unique sound that we have. Thank you so much, Marion, for the presentation and for the invitation. And to just repeat that, that's January 13th, Saturday. What time was that, Marion? Uh, it'll be at the NAVE. Our content is from 11 to 3, and it's available on Zoom as well, online. Thank you very much. And uh, I will make sure that uh, the members get an invitation um, to this and that it's published, uh, publicly noticed so that folks can attend if, if they're interested. Um, any just immediate responses or questions? Yeah. Well, I this pipeline of sharing sounds great, but as far as the cool factor, we just need an amazing amphitheater in the Chugach range that, you know, people would love Blackwater Railroad Company tried to do one up at Willowa Lakes, a concert. They've done several out of Seward at Haines Head. And that setting of being in the mountains and our music, that's that's key. <laughs> Pretty cool. Cool, right on. Uh, there's not either ors. These are all yeah. in, in, included in. Um, any other just member responses? Well, I'll just follow up and say that uh, Boise was a great place to visit. Um, unique, 
in in and of itself, and it's a D1 town. So first of all, there's a very big difference being a Division One school with 20,000 new students every year and a 70% retention rate of graduates in this in this place. So they have a different motor on the back end um, than we have, but they have recognized that this this ecosystem does draw and is part of uh, what creates vitality and vibrance in town. And just to note that, uh, and I'll share this uh, as a photo uh, so that we may share with members here too, but when you think of venues and you think of the ecosystem, let me just put a, a, a practical application on this. We have downtown an office depot it's a wonderfully looking building. It was just it was a, one of the best looking buildings in Anchorage downtown, as you all know. And, <laughs> uh, and it's in the East Anchorage corridor. That is an opportunity corridor for development and growth. Well, in Boise, they also had a downtown office depot. But today that office depot is a multi-aged, is an all-aged venue that was redeveloped and also has nightlife engagements on the rooftop. So they turn basically their office depot to a blown out willow walk, fully blown it. But you can't do that in and of itself in, in a vacuum, right? It's part of an ecosystem that they've been investing in, developing, and growing toward. And so when we think of what are the opportunities in town, not only for building, but also the barriers to create some of this energy and this inertia, we talked about the, the trade routes. What that really represents is our ambassadors. And ambassadors from Anchorage that are the, the, the cultural bearers, they get to go other places, and that drives people saying, I want to go visit. And I would just put a fine personal note on it. I first visited Alaska as a traveling artist, as a touring artist. So ambassadorship matters. Uh, and I'll also put a note on it to recognize that last year we had, uh, and this is independent of this conversation, but it all goes to this ecosystem I did. Last year we had a big music festival at Cutty Park. And the music festival at Cutty Park smashed right up into other issues of city government, uh, particularly the homeless issues, and, uh, and those questions. And so there's a lot going on. Well, I've invited that group for the showdown to come next month, February, so that we can preemptively start thinking of what are the the barriers to being able to grow a successful uh, activity like that? What are the economic benefits that we can start to understand better? And it really goes to destination anchorage. And the idea that we're talking right now with AEDC is going to do their next um, luncheon, and it's all about the choose anchorage and why do you choose anchorage? And the creative sectors, the arts and the culture, the music, uh, those things help people choose place. Um, and the other way around it is when there's opportunities to explore, to, to grow in those places uh, with those sectors, they give people who have chosen place for other purposes the ability to grow. And I think about that with respect to, uh, and I don't know how good his music is, but I'll shout out Matt Spafford, uh, who is a former director of Solid Ray Services, who is a band uh, leader and a, and a rock musician, right? And so there are creatives in our workforce. There are creatives in our city uh, who, if there are barriers that we can identify, we can reduce, and if there are opportunities we can grow, that may also contribute to improving the quality of life of people who are not here to be lost, but who have artistic or creative expressions that they'd like to have the city manage. And I think that all contributes to both of living, working, and playing in a healthy environment. But I'll put a finer point on this that I hope that the Health Policy Committee picks up and so member Brown. Uh, I see all of this as part of quality of life fundamental with respect to the challenges of mental health and public health and the way that the, the arts, the culture sector is more than just economic development for us. It really is about wellness. And I hope that we have a kind of a, a holistic approach from the assembly's perspective mm -hmm. to support these types of endeavors. And so I wanted to open it up. I, I will have the show the showdown folks come see what challenges they face. 
they're, they have a new plan for this year, and I'm excited about hearing about it. Uh, but I'd like this conversation to continue and just to invite members to continue to ping into this and see where it takes us. Cool. Excellent. And uh, I know the, the next item here uh, for discussion is, I'm going to turn it over to Member Cross. It's AO 2023-136, Optional Independent Commercial Plan Review. Member Cross. Thank you. And in order to, uh, you know, as, as your musicians win or if they move up here, let's make sure they have a place to live, shall we? So. Yeah, they should go to a pallet shelter, right? Yeah, there you go. They, we don't want them living on tents. Living in tents, playing guitars. Okay. So uh, this is an extension. So last year we uh, I began with this. This was a 2022-100, uh, 100S. Similar to what we do in, uh, this is to extend, similar to what we do already allow in residential with some pretty significant alterations and changes. So currently, as it sits in, as you know, for a single family and duplex, uh, you can do independent plan review for structures. Okay? And looking to extend that into commercial, um, this wasn't something that basically uh, was just, you know, hatched out of a basement and just came out of the creative uh, confines of my mind. Uh, this was actually brought to us by many, many commercial contractors and a long list of uh, public outcry and has been actually wanting to, to look at further for years. Um, in fact, back when Adam Tromley was in fact on the, uh, on the assembly, he previewed this. I picked up some of his previous work and we continued with it. Um, at first, the original AO mirrored, just for the spaces of beginning, figuring out where we need to get, mirrored essentially what it was for residential. And we realized that that just doesn't apply, because in commercial construction, there's much more things to take into consideration. So if we were going to allow the option for third-party structural plan review, what are the concerns that creep up that are significantly different than commercial and then, then residential, and how do we address those specifically? And that took place in a work session, both here at CDC with an independent work session, and then we also I met with SEAC, which is the Structural Engineers Association of Alaska. They had some comments and concerns, and so we have this draft version. What it had happened was, um, this was, it's, and it's 99.9% uh, ready to, you know, to introduce and get before you. But at that time, we had the April elections, and many of you, we had five new assembly members catch on, and we had a version that had gone metamorphosized significantly. And so it was under the recommendation of Chair Constance said, hey, listen, you know what? This is a complex issue, and it's going to be really hard for you to try to explain this to a new group of individuals that haven't worked with you through the process of how we came to this. It might be better to postpone it indefinitely, clean it up into the new revised version that went through many amendments. And then once we have an assembly that's more had been, been engaged and caught a little bit up with what happens on the building department, reintroduce it so that you're not dealing with, so you're not basically, the new members on the assembly weren't drinking from a fire hydrant of this huge fat packet of legislation of what we're trying to do and just immediately just put your guards up. So now that we've had some opportunity to understand some of the issues we're trying to deal with, bring this back and then discuss the changes that took place. So what does it look like? First, I want it to be very, very conscious that when we talk about allowing a professional engineer to independently review and to provide it, what is a professional engineer? Professional engineer is an individual that's gone to school, they've got their bachelor's or equivalent, four years in college. They've also, a licensed engineer through the state of Alaska are required to pass the fundamentals of engineering principles and practice exams Means they're required to take multiple state exams, as well as uh, take courses in Arctic engineering in support to NCES, NCES, uh, I forget, it was a national certification, of, I believe it's engineers, um, a council record and submit transcript, references, fees, and accounts of previous professional engineering supervisors to get licensed in their particular field. This is not your, uh, you know, mail in, get your certificate. This is a very esteemed credential to become a professional engineer. It is egregiously much more difficult than it is to become a home inspector or fill in the blank, okay? Um, you might put this that there are some individuals who go to medical school for as long as it takes to get a PE, but we don't micromanage med the medical department to the degree that we do in some of our engineering. So let's take a look at this. 
So what is the goal? The goal is to create efficient and shorter turnaround time for design phase and construction projects in which lower, which then turns and lowers the cost of construction. Okay? It, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes when there's unique forms of construction or something we haven't done here, it can take months and months to get approval. I can tell you that is tremendously expensive. The debt service on let's say two and a half million dollars, which is a small commercial project, the debt service is about $25,000 a month. So if you're paying $25,000 a month on debt service for a $2.5 million bill, and you're waiting 10 to 11 months in order to get your footing and foundation or whatever you need to permit, I want you to look at what that does to the cost of construction. Okay, so we understand that time is money. Two, provide a more, Provide more flexibility in the review process and allow permit applicants to seek out specialists in relation to the project type that offer added benefit of insurance protection. Example, and I can only use my own personal, you guys know I own Quantum Laundry, I've done commercial projects. It took us 10 months to get plans approved in Anchorage to remodel an existing laundromat. It took us 60 days in Palmer to build a brand new 6,000 square foot facility with all new. And we brought in a team of professional engineers. In fact, we had them then re we had the building reinspected by the hospital, so we had hospital contracts, professional engineers to represent the CDC, and we passed with flying colors. Okay? I could never have done that project. We could have never done that project in Anchorage. It would still be in review plan phase. Because we had to upgrade water lines, upgrade gas lines to six-inch gas mains. What we had to do was tremendous, but we were able to use third party and we were able to get it done in less than a year, as opposed to 10 months for plan approval to remodel existing building in Anchorage. I can only speak to my personal, and I can tell you other issues that other contractors have had. I'm not here trying to solve my problems. I'm here trying to solve a problem that is, that is specific to all of Anchorage and commercial construction. Finally, maintain the choice on whether to engage in private qualified independent plan reviewer or engage in municipality plan. It is an option. If you don't want to use it and you want to use the magnificent team at the municipality of Anchorage, you're more than welcome to do that. And if you have a great relationship and if you've had the experience with them and that has worked working for you, then you are encouraged to continue to do so. This provides an option specifically when we're talking excuse me, about specialized fields of commercial construction. All right. So again, a little bit of changes since review. So what did we change regarding the rent from the commercial to the from the residential to commercial? One is we recognize that the $250,000 insurance requirement was just simply not enough, okay? Keep in mind that when you use the MOA plan reviewers, may I ask you, do you know how much you're insured for if there's a mistake? How much will they insure if they make a mistake? It is zero. So under this, the required minimum amount of professional liability insurance that's not offered when you use the MOA is a minimum of $1 million or 50% of the estimated value of the project whichever is greater. So this is to make sure the individuals, if there's mistakes, that they're insured, okay? Um, additional protections. Uh, on residential, it's only $250,000. That's even if they're building you a $750,000. So this is a greater insurance requirement that's even required under the residential. For what's, you can build a million dollar home, they're still only required to have a $250,000 policy. Under this, if you were building a million dollar commercial property, you gotta have you know minimum one million, and then 50% as it goes up. We did look to exclude significant structures. So what are significant structures? Significant structures are things like power plants, schools, uh, buildings over 100 feet. Um, uh, I think it's residential complexes, and it's either, forgive me, I'm trying to remember if it's 300 or 500, but there's a certain capacity of uh, a size of building that now that's considered significant. And so that would still have, uh, you know, that still would go through the MOA and you still go through that approval process. I am considering an amendment that says that it will allow for third party on significant structures provided they pass an application or they have some sort of, uh, uh, that goes through the uh, building official to say that they have shown that they've done this kind of construction before, they have experience, and they get pre-approved as basically a significant structure uh, third party uh, um, uh, engineer, okay? Um, we can discuss that uh, later. Finally, establishes a 10% of audits for structural plans using independent plan reviewers. So what we're also encouraging is we're encouraging the billing department to audit these plans, take a look at them, and make sure that we're not, um, you know, uh, and, 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 and let's police that and make sure that, because I'm sure the building department knows 
of specific maybe uh, issue uh, they, they, they've seen uh, plans or the same things that they've or a group of it listen good and bad in every there's good and bad in every industry I'm sure the building department probably knows some individuals that we need to keep a closer eye on okay I'm not neglect I'm, I'm not denying that exists so this allows for a 10% audit and they're encouraged to do a 10% audit of audit any plan review um, it also, uh, you know, the commercial option independent plan reviewer would use the same multiplier that has to do with the pre-approval plan process. Um, there's no alternative to options submitting and maintaining professional liability insurance waivers or claims against the facility will not be accepted. So that's that final point. Just understanding that when you use a third-party professional engineer, there's actually additional protections that are in there that you don't get when you use the municipality of Anchorage. Um, additionally, in here, um, there was another change, if I can recall. Don't see it listed in here. Let's go through and I'll see if it remembers what comes back to me. Okay, so what are the details? Allows the building permit applicant for commercial building or structural construction project the option to utilize a qualified professional from the private sector to review building structural plans and calculations and then stamp them, which is going to be submitted with the application for a building permit. Um, oftentimes, what we see if there's not very specific things that the muni is cleared on. Or, or they're coming back and forth with questions and concerns, they don't get their F and F permit, and this can really drag things out in this causes. And if we go in, as you know, once you go past, you have a narrow window to really get your foundation in that's, gonna, that's going to significantly reduce the cost of construction. Um, and that's probably, you would say, arguably May through October. If it's beyond that, and you start getting ground freeze, or we know you can't even bring your utilities in, you can't do, uh, you know, the, the, there's certain windows of opportunity that you have. Once you go into winter construction, we've discussed this before and different things, the cost goes up about 30% on any kind of construction job. Not just, imagine how much snow is out here and trying to get your foundation in when it's dumping. And not only that, but imagine putting in your foundation with dirt mixed with snow and then hoping come spring when it turns to mud. So what we're looking at is how do we expedite these timelines and allow these things to run smoother during the peak construction periods. I would anticipate that during the slower periods that most people would just use the MOA, right? When, when there's not a backlog um, because, well, if, since and if they're doing a fantastic job and it doesn't save you any money to use a private PE, then why not just use the union, use the staff that's in there, right? And make sure that you go to union. So I anticipate, and what we've heard from the construction industry is this would be used, this would give them an option in limited extent during those peak period times or during times of specialized construction dealing with things that um, maybe the MOA is not used to handling. And finally, we've got a MUA oversight role. This is important, it is important for us to have an oversight role. I'm not set, if nobody wants reckless building, we just want to expedite those timelines. I encourage you to read through um, the oversight role, an existing program for residential option independent plan review. So then it talks a little bit about the existing, uh, what we have currently for residential. And, you know, I think this is important for us to have a conversation and at least, you know, even if we just draft this, and I'd be open to saying, let's put this in effect for two years and see how it plays out and it expires or extends under assembly approval after two years just to say, is it working as intended, okay? But we recognize with the staffing issues that we have, with the employee issues, with the workload, and the fact that we're trying to get to building, that one of the largest obstructions and the cost, pro and the cost of commercial construction, you know, is that right out of the gate. That, that cost of trying to get your plans approved and everything, because you know, a builder is not going to invest significant capital until they own the land and they know it's there, okay? Which means once they've purchased the land and they've gone to a bank for a builder's line of credit, they're expending a lot of expense. Are you gonna go get a set of approved plans and spend sixty dollars to $100,000 on a lot you don't own? No, so they've already put it into the aggregate. They're buying the land, they're intending to move forward. They usually get some verbal approvals from departments, so they come in and say, this is what we're thinking about going, but until you actually start going through the process and you realize all the delays and what happens, at that point, they're spending tens, if not more, of thousands of dollars a month through what is sometimes a laborious process. So how do we expedite this and how do we get it? I think this is a reasonable uh, approach. We've allowed it in residential. This allows it to a limited extent in commercial. Again, it's only an option. 
It does give the building department the group to audit and oversight. Um, it does require that it's done by a PE, a professional engineer, and we've discussed the credentials of that individual. These are not lackluster individuals who got their license out of a Cracker Jack box. Okay. And I think this will uh, go a long way towards uh, letting the, at least the, letting businesses and contractors know that Anchorage is once again open for business. Questions? I'm with Johnson and then uh, I'm uh, Rob. I, I guess my first question would be, so, you know, Kevin's asserted that it takes a long time, many, many months for these plans to get reviewed right now. I mean, is that, the case and is that because we're going on back with staff? Is that just how long it takes? I mean, is, is this um, is the the underlying problem is that we don't have people here at the municipality to, to you know, deal with this in an adequate time? What's the uh, what does it look like from from our perspective? Uh, through the chair, this is Ross Nossinger, acting building official. Um, uh, no, at, at the current time, no, it's not taking you know, months or whatever to get through the process. And um, I actually wrote up um, an outline of the permit process and and focused it on plan review and structural plan review because structural plan review seems like it's, it's always the issue. It's the most detailed review we do um, and whatnot. And, and, and I wrote it for the assembly and I sent it to the assembly, but I'm not sure if many of you, the members have been able to read it and I would highly rec I can send it to you, and I highly recommend you read it because it, 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 from a historical perspective, it outlines the changes the department has made to our business processes to speed up the whole process. Like when you apply for a building permit, we don't require that you submit complete plans, right? Which basically allows the design to happen concurrently with the review process, right? So the designers are actually designing this building as we're reviewing it. That, that's very common because we do have a very tight window, right, to get these foundations in. Very important to get this work done in the summertime. Otherwise, there's exceptional costs if you have to light tin heat in the wintertime. And, and we, we issue partial permits. And we can issue basically any type of partial permit. We can, we can issue a footing and foundation permit. If we can't approve the whole footing and foundation, we can issue a partial footing and foundation permit. We've even done that before. You're approved from grids one to 10, you know? Um, so, so we've altered these business practices throughout the year to speed up the process, because this is not a new issue. Th this issue has existed ever since the municipality of Anchorage um, performed a detailed plan review and issued building permits. Um, Additionally, if the assembly would like to entertain a private plan review option, my, myself and my staff have actually drafted an ordinance that it's, uh, has a lot cleaner language because it's, it's written from you know the perspective of like, the people who have worked in this industry for decades. And um, like one of the things we. In our proposed version, we're not going to require insurance, right? Because this insurance we're talking about is errors and emissions insurance. And, and it's about protecting me as the engineer, or, or protecting me as the private plan reviewer, or protecting me as the builder. It's not about protecting the building owner, and it's not about protecting the subsequent people that are going to live in the building. And nowhere in the building codes do they talk about insurance in any of the building codes because it's a non-issue. The building codes are about protecting the building occupants, not the people who construct the buildings and the, who design the buildings, right? So, any, any, any questions? <laughs> well, correction, because there's a difference between e and insurance and liability insurance, and this is a liability insurance requirement. So just a clarification. Who is liability, though? It is to cover damages from inadequate third-party plan review. Who is if they cause If they cause damages, it would be to insure the building owner, because they would be liable for it, so they have a liability. You have liability insurance. You don't be on your vehicle. You crash into somebody. 
you're liable up to whatever if you cause damages because of your actions. So, so that would be the I choice if, of if the you're interested in that, Ross, to... I will. I would be more than happy to get you a description from an, an insurance auditor because neither of us are insurance carriers, but I'm happy to do that for you. I, I guess the fault in Russ. So, so like, let's imagine that I, you know, I'm coming to your apartment right now and I want to build a commercial structure. You know, I, I slap down a permit and then start the planning process. I mean, what? One of the most significant delays. I mean, you talked about this sort of phased approach, right? Where I can start some work and then, you know, as we progress, the plan review gets progresses alongside that. I mean, what, what's the longest I might have to to wait? What's the longest that I might have to be sitting on my thumbs waiting for you guys to, to turn something around for me? So, there, there's so many variables here, right? Uh, if you're building a new building, though, if if you submit the slow time of the year, which is right now, all the reviews would be initiated from all the various disciplines within a week of that, of that thing showing up to our building. Today, look at our review times where we're at today, mm -hmm. right? Um, and if it's, a, if it's a brand new building, it might take the structural reviewer, say, three days to do the review. Some, some buildings um, come in with over a thousand pages of calculations, right? And so it might take a structural reviewer a week to get through that re review initially. Um, and so there, a brand new building is going to go through like 12 reviews. It's going to go through your zoning review, your land use compliance. It's going to go through structural, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, um, the SWIP review, the stormwater runoff. The vast majority of these reviews get completed within like a week or two of it being submitted. Um, but then sometimes there are staffing issues, like fire for instance fire might have a staffing issue and it might take them extra time to get to it you know this ordinance isn't proposing anything to address the the ordinance is only for structural review so if your holdup is in and any other review other than structural there's zero gain right well then you make a great case that perhaps we should expand this to some of the other venues um, the the version we drafted, we actually do expand it. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Um, and then we have somebody on the line. Actually, I have, I have somebody calling. Cool. Now, Member Brawley, and then we'll have a, a, a sure. call. Um, yeah, I had a question, I guess, for the residential third party mm -hmm. reviews. How many have happened in recent years? Like, is that something that's commonly used? Because I know it's in our code. The Just, residential? Yeah. And I think that's probably a question. As far as a percentage, that's a great question for that. Yeah. Yeah, through the chair, I mean, we haven't looked at, I haven't looked at the, the data lately, but the vast majority of new single family homes and duplexes are reviewed by third party reviewers. And I, I would say the last time we looked at percentages, it was over two thirds. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to get that number so maybe that's something staff can provide, um, maybe back uh, five years or whatever it may be. Um, and I guess I'm open to the idea of it being time limited. Um, I'm, I would be less interested in two years, maybe um, something more like, I don't know if September 30th is too soon. I guess I'm, I'm still trying to understand kind of what the flow of a project is, because I understand there's all the pre-development work, and then there's you know the stuff that you have to get to, with, to when you're actually building. And I know our building season is typically the summer, and so I'm just wondering, if there's a short time frame, what would that look like if it started you know three months from now? Would, Anyway, I'm, I'm just thinking, because I guess I, I would hope that, um, I think this and, and other discussions like this are really getting at the point that it, it takes a long time for us to get through the development process. And so one path is that we fix it at the city, um, whatever that looks like, whether it's staffing, efficiency, redoing the process, you know, we've had some conversations about that. Um, otherwise, th there is this push to keep contracting it out, because if we can't fix it internally, we're holding ourselves up and so I don't know what the right answer is I guess I just want to put those two paths on the table because may maybe it's both um, but we can't keep doing things the way we are now and so it's frustrating to hear oh we get through things really quickly except XYZ and then we're still hearing from folks who are using this process including individual homeowners who are saying it takes a long time and that that is that puts a cost on everybody so anyway I, I don't know what the right answer is but um, so on the line, I asked Ron Thompson to join us. As you know, he's know he owns a scope permitting engineering. So, and Ron can speak a little bit about his business and his experience. Um, he is an individual that commercial and, and residential contractors hire to help negotiate 
the complexities of the municipality permitting and approval process. And specifically dealing with, uh, as I can personally tell you, uh, mistakes made by plan reviewers or they were saying that this is required by code and then oh wait that is not. And, and in order to justify the way it is and show in code, you have to employ somebody in order to help present your case. And so Ron, uh, if you want to speak a little bit, uh, I've asked you to join us and on whether or not you think third party professional engineering plan review for structural is necessary or not. This is Ron Thompson, just to tell you a little bit. I, I do own scope permitting. I was the building official in Anchorage for over 10 years. I, I was back there recently. You guys can hear me, right? Yep. Thank you very much, Ron. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, I would say that 10 years ago when I was working as a municipality, I wasn't a big fan of third-party review and I had the same reservations typical that Ross kind of just presented. But now being on the outside for eight years and working through the system, I realized that the, the safety is not the issue. It's never about the comments. The comments aren't the issue. It is about timing and it's about speed and it's about getting permits and get them open and get them reviewed and get the permits uh, uh, at specific times of the year. I mean, the review right now, yeah, it's absolutely flying through. Daniel King's throwing through, going through a lot of projects, but come August, we were waiting months to get a structural review and getting permits, and we got held up for time to where we couldn't even get in the ground, and not one change was made on the plans, and that's the issue. Is It's, it's not a matter of the 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 comments. We can always address comments. I do almost every single residential permit now by third party, and I've never had one project yet go to a third party reviewer and get no comments. So the, the licensed engineers that are in the industry doing plan review like Dan Fulmer, like Jesse Gabelli, like Seth Anderson, are the same people that do engineering. They're licensed people. They're very solid at what they do, and they're very um, confident in their plan reviews. We've had a few projects that have went and decided they can't be um, third party, and then we put them through um, for uh, the muni review, and they turn out just fine and don't get any additional comments um, when we go through the municipality if we've been through and got converted from where we thought it was third party and it was not able to be. So as Ross said, this time of year, great, numbers look good for for structural, but they don't look good, like Ross said, for fire and some of the other disciplines. It, it is a bigger issue, as Ross said. It's not just structural. It's multiple facets of uh, fire is one of the most difficult to get through. Zoning has delayed in, in a large way, but they're going through transitional people right now, and, and that's uh, hopefully going to get better. But, I mean, I, I would say I probably, my office probably permits, I, I don't know, 50 to 60 percent of all permits in Anchorage. And the, the number one concern is not not the comments, it's the time it takes to get everything through and the difficulty and the lack of um, professional behavior toward the people. And so they just are done with dealing with the municipality. So they come to me and you know, my my daughter Kaylee does a lot of the permitting over at the department. She has a good demeanor and good rapport with almost everyone down there. So, I mean, we get projects through. Do we get them as through even closely to the time frame we used to? No. We used to get residential permits within three days. Now we'd be lucky to get a residential permit period within a week, uh, if not ten days or longer. Um, there's subsequent reviews that go in different disciplines they crisscross and cross over and and structural being the one that the most is the most frustrating that engineers that i talk to and discuss this with uh, and i think that uh, that they will be responding in the next week to the assembly saying they support this because they feel like there's so many things that are that are identified that are not fully understood because they, they may or may not have enough experience out in the field. They may or may not 
be flexible to kind of work with um, the private side. I mean, I just got done doing a car wash on Abbott Road that took over a year um, to help permit. Uh, granted, there's some issues with the architect, and granted, there's some issues with certain things, but the engineers were so frustrated, the structural folks uh, with the reviewer, and, and I can, you know, I, I couldn't really, at the point that they got a hold of me, I couldn't really do a whole lot to speed anything up, but we did get to a final solution. I directed them and guided them through uh, what the muni would want. They permitted all over the country, and they, they also, and, and I also know that it's not always that the building departments run plan review. In, in many, many, many jurisdictions, it's privatized. This is not a new idea. It's done all over the country. Um, it's, you know, the state of Alaska, if you look at them, they don't do a structural review at all. They do a fire life safety review, and it's up to the engineers to get their, their stuff re-looked at and privatized. So the state of Alaska doesn't do a structural review outside of the city of Anchorage unless the jurisdiction chooses to do so. Right, so I, I don't think it's, the liability isn't... I want to leave enough time for people who have some questions. We're only about 10 minutes. Yeah. Ahead. So okay. anyway, hopefully that helps, and I'll put some more in writing to, to get to you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Did any of these simply have any questions specifically for Ross as we got them on the phone? Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just ask um, Ross, you said you had an alternative um, ordinance, so please bring it forward hopefully to the next committee meeting. It's ready to share as a draft. There will, there will be another work session on this on January 19th. It will be before the assembly at the next meeting, which is. February 22nd. I can't oh, yeah. The 22nd. 22nd, 23rd. Anyway, the 19th, that Friday, there will be another work session on this. There may be some small revisions. We're looking at the application process and questioning whether or not, you know, before they become, pre the, the, you know, should there be an application process to become qualified as a, as a uh, third party uh, independent plan reviewer. And I'd also really love to see what Ron has, uh, excuse me, what Ross has as well. Because if we're willing to grow upon this in order to expedite things, uh, I think that's uh, I think that's critical. Um, I'll close with this: in that this is, uh, you know, I mean just we have run the cost of building up so high, not just makers, but across the United States. We have basically we are squeezing affordability out of all real estate, commercial, residential, otherwise. Do you know who the number one buyer of homes was? In 2023, it wasn't homeowners. It was corporations, it was BlackRock. We've driven the price of housing up so expensive that the number one buyer of homes are corporations buying homes. Well, Thomas Jefferson said private property ownership and freedom are inseparable. And if corporations own all our housing, are you really free? Call me a conspiracy, put a, put a muskrat hat on my head, Put me out in the woods with a black powder rifle, but locally we can we can deal with this. There's things we can do to prevent that, and so I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Cool. Uh, thank you, Member Cross. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson, for joining us today as well. And I want to refer Cross uh, to forward the item that you're working on. You also mentioned the checklist, uh, and I just think the checklist that you described is that a public document? Yes, I, I, I drafted um, yeah. the outline of the um, the permit process. Yeah, I, it yeah. would just be good for us to, I, to publish that again on our on our particular website for this commission. Hey, 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 Ross, I have it saved. To I'll Mandy. send it to Claire to send to everybody. It was it's a fantastic document. Well, let's, pages. let's forward it to Mandy, and we'll have it published on our page as well. So this way, the public can have an opportunity to look through that too. Uh, yeah, right here. So I just wanted to close this part of the conversation by saying I heard a few different things and they don't always, they don't seem to all run concurrently. There are some different challenges and different buckets and different timings. And I don't know that any of those, of what we talked about today answers the question of like, why would uh, a, a commercial business be easier to build in another part of the state? Right, so the question of the, the, the you know, the quantum uh, example that Member Cross mentioned 
I'm interested in those questions. Like, how, do, how does Anchorage get to yes? Why can't we get to yes? What are those challenges? And I don't know that any of what, what I've heard today necessarily lands on answering those types of questions, although I think this is all important for us to learn more about um, and for the public to be involved. I heard questions about staffing, and, uh, and so I'd be interested in, in, in having a sense of, of, of that bigger picture as well. Cool. Uh, on that note, are there any members of the public here who would like to give comments? Are there any members of the public on the phone who would like to give comments? Right. Are there any other members of the assembly who have anything you would like to add into uh, this discussion before we close? Great. And on that note, I appreciate all the staff for being here. Thank you, assembly members. And thank you, uh, Lance, for the, the, the commitment to aligning with our committee and, and your workflow so that we can have uh, a unified front. Thank you. Appreciate that. And we, we are adjourned at... 1025? Yeah. Five minutes early. Look at that. 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 Look at that.